Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the fourth online leadership series. Um, and with me here today, I have Beatrice, my co-host, and our special guest, um, Dr. Ambili Banijay. Um, Ambili, you're welcome to today's show. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. If you have any questions, please post it in the chat group and um, we will go through the questions as we have a chat with um, Ambili and um, pick up on your questions as well. Um, if there's anything you want or any housekeeping, please reach out to Beatrice through the chat group and she'll be able to assist you if you have any questions or you need any directions or links as to find out more about AFBE UK and what we do at AFBE UK. Um, please just ask your questions and we will get um, answers to you straight away. So thank you all for joining us this um, dark evening. Um, so down to Amberly. I will just introduce Amberly and then we'll pick it up from there. So um, following Dr. Amberly's PhD, um, she worked as a postdoctoral scientist for nine years at Imperial College and um, University College London, where she focused on neuroscience. She moved to GSK 13 years ago and has worked within regulatory affairs, audits, and assurance and most importantly, inclusion and diversity, and has held various senior roles in GSK, including working as a director for the past seven years. Ambly has recently been recognized in the 2020 Empower Ethnic Minority Role Model List as the top 100 ethnic minority future leader. She's an active advocate for inclusion diversity and equity. And she's passionate about ensuring the next generation have equal access to opportunities. Ambly, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Glad to be here, glad to be here. Nice, nice. So um, to kickstart um, the topic that we're here for today, which is um, diversity and inclusion, um, I would ask um, Ambili to, first of all, introduce herself just a little bit, something that I haven't said, and um, we'll kick off with a simple explanation of what diversity is and what inclusion is, just to set the tone and the basis for today's conversation. Um, Ambili, over to you. Thank you. So uh, in terms of an introduction, what else can I say? I think you've said it all, Roy. But, um, I'm a mother, I'm a carer, I'm a, um, a married, uh, been married for about 20 years. Um, I'm an antique collector, <laughs> <laughs> so some few snippets of who I am. Um, so yeah, diversity and inclusion, a really, really pa a topic that is close to my heart uh, in terms of uh, the conversation. So really excited to be here to, to answer some questions. Beautiful, thank you very much. So um, to kick start, can you give us um, in your own clear terms, what diversity and inclusion means? Okay, so there's a couple of analogies. I talk in analogies a lot and I think in analogies. So I came across a, a definition just today where somebody said diversity is being invited to a party. Inclusion is being asked to dance, right? I think of it slightly differently but whichever works for you. So diversity for me, if you're, if you <laughs> like drinking, to me, soft drinks, I don't drink personally, but you know, I think of diversity as having lots of different bottles in your drinks cabinet. <laughs> and I think of inclusion as the cocktail you make from it, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes it more interesting, the drink more interesting, the mocktail or the cocktail more interesting when you mix things together yeah. and you get diverse things. If you have just orange juice, you can't suddenly put it in a cocktail glass and say it's a cocktail, right? No. It will just be orange juice. Or if you have tiny smidgens of something else, you won't taste it because it's not the appropriate mix. So that's, for me, a, a better definition of actually what is inclusion. It's about feeling like you fit in, that your, your place is there because you're adding something to it and making 
making it more interesting, making adding value in that mix. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so we're here to talk about diversity and inclusion in the workplace and how it's impacted you. Um, you've been involved in a lot of diversity and inclusion groups within your organization. Um, tell us a bit about your story. How has um, the topic of diversity impacted you directly um, within your progression in your career? So I'm, I'm actually going to take the story slightly further back before I even started my career, mm -hmm. right? So I started, uh, I moved to the UK when I was 13. And when I first moved, I, I grew up in Mumbai. And when I first moved to the UK, I just felt completely out of sorts. You know, I felt like I would never fit in. So what I mean by this is I remember I was 15 years old when I was invited to the first white home by my friend for a Christmas party. Mm. So I walked into her house and her mum said, you know, would you like some eggnog love? And my response to her was, yes, thank you, auntie. Because in my culture, we're supposed to respect everybody who's older, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the African culture is similar. And I said, auntie, and they looked at each other and laughed. And I didn't know what I'd messed up in those two words, thank you and auntie, what had not, you know, but I knew I'd messed up because the response didn't match, right? So to hide my embarrassment, I take a swig of the eggnog now, who knew that there's raw egg and milk and cream and alcohol mixed up in a drink served to kids, right? So I literally threw up, <laughs> spat it all out. So within 30 seconds of walking into this white home, I felt like, oh my God, these people are aliens. You know, what am I doing here? So you feel this complete discomfort when cultures clash, right? Cultures yeah. meet. And there's a real discomfort because you are, you don't understand the other people's culture. Sure. But it went on that Amanda became my best friend. Her mom loved me eventually because, you know, she realized the positive influence I was on her kid. I was studious and, you know, respectful, whatever. So after a while of interacting, you realize you've actually got more in common. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the end of the day, they're all human. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you break past the initial barriers, we're all the same. Sure. So um, how did I, I take that forward? So coming into a career perspective. So as you mentioned, you know, I did my degree, um, got a first class degree, did a PhD, and then thought, I really think I want to go to industry. So I tried to get into industry and I was pretty much told you're too much of an academic in, in interviews, right, in industry. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what does that mean? What does it mean? I'm too much of an academic at age 24 or something, you know? It's not 55, mm -hmm. <laughs> 24, 26, you're already too much of an academic. And I kept getting rejected. So then I started looking, when I moved to UCL, I thought I must figure out how I can move. I mean, it took me seven years at UCL to figure out how to move to GSK, right? But what I did, I started watching these kinds of talks and videos and things about people who had Done, done well. And one of the pieces of advice I got is networking is really key, absolutely sure. fundamental. Mm -hmm. So I started, and, and all networking is, is talking to somebody else and being really open with them about what you want, what your dreams are. So I was chatting to a friend in a pub to say, you know, I would really like to work in industry. What do you do? And she said, oh, I work with industry on a consultant basis, but I'm working at UCL. Mm. And I was fascinated in what she was doing because she was doing that part-time on top of her day job, which was similar mm. to mine. Anyway, we had a great pub chat. Six months down the line, she comes and finds me in my lab and says, I'm leaving, do you want the job? You seem really interested, right? That was my entry into working as a business development contact at UCL. That led to my head of department asking me to set up a course to run um, a course for PhD students who wanted to come to industry okay. at UCL, right? And I remember thinking, I can't even get a job myself. Why am I going to run a course, you know? Uh, but sometimes if other people have confidence in you, it's worth believing in yourself, right? And sometimes you need somebody else, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, fine. I will, I will set up and run the course. 
uh, and doing that course for two years, I learned everything I was doing wrong, right? About how I was selling myself to industry. And that's all it was. I didn't need to do any other experience. I, I developed my marketing skills in marketing myself to be able to then come into GSK. Mm -hmm. Now, GSK, I've been here 13 years and I started at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And within about six years, I went from entry level position to a director position. So really spectacular increase. Yeah. Why? Because about a year into GSK, I was fed up. I was doing really admin -y job, but you know, I'd taken a 10K pay cut and gone to an entry level position just to get in. And I was filling in forms all day long. And I thought, I've done much better than this. I can do more. And I was pretty much ready to leave. I was interviewing with a competitor. And my manager figured out that something was wrong. And she asked me, are you going to resign? And I said, I hadn't got the job yet. So I said, I'm interviewing. Because I, I didn't want to lie to her. And then two days later, resign, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that conversation basically led to me sitting in front of a, of a very senior person at GSK who said, stay at GSK, I'll take accountability, I'll help you, right? That is a sponsor. Now, I didn't even know she was a sponsor at the time, but that sponsorship relationship lasted for those six years while I got pulled up through the organization. Mm -hmm. Now, she, she moved on to another role six months down the line. She didn't promote me, but she was in the same organization connecting me to people, giving me opportunities to do great projects, Right. So when you go for an interview, you can talk about these interesting projects. Mm. So I had the benefit of that at, at, in my career. And I moved up GSK's organization abnormally fast. So within six years, director, I thought, you know, I can achieve anything. I mean, I really thought, right, next role in a couple of years. And then I hit a, a glass barrier. And initially I thought, must be me. Right. I don't have enough place I've only stayed in one department or a couple of different departments haven't shown that I can work in other places so I, I developed myself I went on secondments I went on an external assignment working for an NGO in a different field I, I took on Brexit managing Brexit across the whole GSK business within regulatory affairs for the UK so do, did some really high profile stuff and I still couldn't get a job then you stop and think Hmm, still don't get a job as in, I, I had my director role, I couldn't get a senior director role, right? That, yeah. So then you start thinking, what's going on here? Is it me or is there something else? Hmm. And at that point in time, uh, our company had set up a global ethnicity council, which is something that many companies are doing. They're setting up senior groups that look at different things, right? So um, the global ethnicity council, senior leaders, looking at ethnicity, when I looked at their composition, it was 100% Caucasian at that time. Mm -hmm. And you think, how is a bunch of white people going to figure out what they need to do for ethnic minorities, right? Yeah, yeah. When you look at the gender council, it was 50% men, 50% women. All white though. So you then start questioning, hold on a minute, women also, and men, you should have some ethnic minority representation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where are all the senior white people? Mm -hmm. And the more questions I started asking, I started realizing we're missing from the top when you look upwards. And that's the same for almost every British organization, right? Exactly. There are reports published that say this is a universal problem in the UK. Most organizations at the top, there's hardly any diversity. Now, director sounds like a, a pretty senior position, but within GSK, there are many other positions on top. You know, we have vice president, president, et cetera. So actually to get to the, pretty difficult if you're from a black or an Asian background. And that's something that I've been actively working on for the last 22 months, last 14 months or so. I've, I'm leading an employee resource group at GSK, co-leading it with uh, another person. Um, and we are working with senior leaders on highlighting this, on highlighting that this is not right. We should not have to face these kinds of barriers because of the color of our skin yeah. or the yeah. biases that come in, the prejudice that come in, where, which, you know, which means that a, a black person will be considered aggressive if they speak up or a, a, an, a Muslim lady who's got her hair covered would immediately be classified as meek 
doesn't have anything to say for herself. This, these are stereotypes people have, right? So immediately they feel you have nothing to add and you have to like work hard to kind of try and shatter that illusion. So anyway, that was a very roundabout answer, touching hopefully on a few elements. Yes. Wow. Um, you have mentioned quite a lot of things and these are things that um, I think we need to bring to bear. You, you, you know, starting from coming from an academic background, um, you were kind of, let me say, engaged, you know, to try and set up a system or, uh, or, or um, a program to help people get into the industry, whereas you yourself hadn't even had the opportunity of going into the industry. But you mentioned something vital there. You said selling yourself and networking which I think is very key. So these are two key issues um, to, to help with um, a diversity, if you ask me, within an organization. However, you know, um, going through everything you did, going into the industry eventually, rising up in six years to become a director, you still hit a glass ceiling. And that is, there's a problem, there's an issue, and there's an issue at the top, you know, and it's now that you know a lot of people are beginning to speak out on on such issues with regards to you know diversity within um, senior management groups you know because you start at the bottom entry level there's a lot of diversity there's yeah. a whole lot of diverse workforce you go to mid mid level management yeah there's a few here and there and you go to senior management or executive level and it's like dead silence there's nothing you know and these people are meant to take decisions that will affect everyone within the um the, 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 the company or the community or the industry you know so um i would ask the question how important is it for there to be bame representation in every level in your opinion absolutely critical you know every company should reflect the geographies they operate in hmm. right there's a business imperative to having that because you won't be able to meet your customer's need, your, in our case, a patient's needs, mm -hmm. if you don't understand those needs. So from a business, purely business money perspective, there's a business imperative to do that. Mm -hmm. You also know that diverse teams are more innovative, right? Every company wants to be innovative. Mm -hmm. You get more innovation when there's diversity of thought. My, my question is, why wouldn't you want diversity? Why wouldn't you want all kinds of diversity to reflect the population in which you operate within your company? Exactly. Right. So it's absolutely important to have diversity. It's funny. Um, I watched a, a show a while ago and um, the lady was talking about diversity and inclusion and how we can solve such issues um, in, in our economy. And she said diversity and inclusion can't be solved um, by the church. It can't be solved by the educational system because there's always a few number of people who actually go into the educational system compared to the wider population. Um, but it can be solved by businesses because everyone in business, there's always somebody who is there to make money and there's always somebody there who's, who's there to collect the money. You know, and that means, you know, within business, you have customers and you have the people giving the service and your customers are always varied. So your service should reflect, um, you know, the, uh, the demographic and, and the diversity of um, your customers. So it's very important for businesses to be the one to bring about that cultural shift, to bring about that diversity within, you know, the economy. It's a really key point. So just to bring that to life a bit. So we currently have COVID, right? Mm -hmm. We know that a lot of pharma companies, the field I'm in, we're working on vaccines, right? Most pharma companies are working on a COVID vaccine yeah. or some medicine. Mm -hmm. Now we also know black and minority ethnic groups suffer from greater problems, more mortality, more death. We're more negatively impacted. Mm -hmm. Now imagine a pharmaceutical company trying to create a COVID medicine where they don't take into account the, the clinical trial populations don't include enough BAME representation. If you are just thinking numbers, let me just get 300 people recruited to study this drug, you might get a drug that doesn't work. 
in a different population, yeah. right? Yeah. So there are real reasons there, you know, it, this is not an abstract thing. This impacts us day to day. We want our medicines to be tested on people like us to make yeah. sure it's effective for us. Because human biology is different. You know, there's a lot of similarities, but there are differences. So even fundamental things like that, it impacts us, you know, whether it's educational opportunities or <laughs> finance opportunities, there are changes, right? Mm -hmm. That is very true. And, and that's very important. Um, I've got another question for you. So um, can we achieve gender parity if we don't understand intersectionality? The Within short the answer is no, you, you cannot solve gender parity because mm -hmm. we, we know that there's, there's still room for improvement, but there's been lots of, uh, lots of gains in the gender agenda, mm -hmm. um, but that's only helped white women to date. You know, when talk, people talk about, oh, we have lots of women in our workforce, what they mean is they've got representation of white women. It hasn't impacted women of color. It hasn't helped women of color. And so if you want to truly get gender parity, you have to look at all women, not just a subset of women, women. right? So absolutely, you have to look at this intersectionally. And I, you know, there may be a lot of people online who don't, never heard the term intersectionality, mm. which uh, you know, it might be worth clarifying that actually intersectionality is about these multiple layers of discrimination causing people to have more problems than, than they would normally. So, you know, if you're, you're, if you're a woman, you're disadvantaged. If you're a black woman, you have even more barriers to climb over. If you're a black woman who's gay, there's even more barriers. And if you're a black woman, gay and disabled, then, you know, you've got to hurdle that high to, to jump over, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what intersectionality is about, that we don't always just fit into one bucket so where there are compounding effects, we need to take into account that people are multifaceted and they might have different things going on and mm. that each of them doesn't contribute on top to, to create a, a bigger hurdle for people. You know, equity is just about leveling the playing field. Let's treat people not, not just the same, but in an equitable way mm. so that they have the same level of barrier to jump across to get a job rather yeah. than some people having to hit a high bar versus others. And others. Now, let's go back to your career progression. Um, so you mentioned that on your, after your first year in, at GSK, you, you, know, you felt you had enough because you were doing less than you should have been doing. I'm, I guess a lot of people find themselves in that kind of position, especially in the workplace, where they have probably been in one place, they've probably risen maybe, They've either become, you know, they've gone past the graduate level and they're probably still doing things that, you know, they, they feel is not necessarily beneath them, but they can do more, you know. Now, you mentioned that um, you technically had a sponsor within your organization. Now, how important is it for someone to have a sponsor within an organization? What are the benefits? What are the pros? What are the cons? of having a sponsor within an organization? So having a sponsor is fundamentally critical. Now, let me define the difference between a mentor, because people sometimes think mentor and having a sponsor is the same thing and they're not, nope. they're very different, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So a mentor is just somebody senior who wants to share their experience. And they're almost like a wise friend. They're giving you some advice right? A sponsor does much more. A sponsor is somebody who's pretty much putting their neck on the line for you. They're taking their reputation to, to advocate for you, to say this person's really good and recommend you for, for roles or connect you with their contacts by putting you in, for, you know, in front of them. So they're taking a personal risk. Now it's fundamentally critical to have mm -hmm. a sponsor, mm -hmm. particularly as you move in higher grades, you know, it's been shown that having a sponsor really helps. Now, how do you go about getting one? It's not so easy, right? We know ethnic minorities are over mentored and under sponsored because people are not so comfortable putting their neck on the line for people like us. 
there's not enough ethnic minorities at the top for us to sponsor ourselves, right? So we need folks from a different race who might not feel so comfortable putting their neck on the line for us if they don't know us well enough. Mm. How did I get a sponsor? Chance, partly. But that chance was also driven by the fact that I was bloody good at my day job, mm. right? I mean, there's a thing that I, I grew up with thinking uh, it was just something that my family used to say to me, you have to work twice as hard to be good exactly. enough. Yeah. But I've heard now that a lot of black and brown families have this in their home, right? A lot of us grow yeah. up with this mantra, yeah. work yeah. twice as hard. Yeah. So we, we're kind of used to this advice. We have to work quite hard. But actually, your hard work gets noticed by people. Mm. And, and your day job is what they assess you on. So you have to always be performing really well on your day job for people to then go, if they see that themselves, they experience that you're good at the job, then they have confidence in you mm. to take that on, right? So that's part of how you go and get it. If you don't have a sponsor, the, the con is that you then have to make those connections yourself and go in front of people you don't know, try and build that connection up yourself and again, it takes time for that person to build trust in you mm. while you have to keep going with the day job, right? Because you can't afford to just make network connections and let your day job fall. Exactly. So people struggle to find the time to do both. Because if you have to perform 110% in your day job, but at the same time be making networking connections, mm. where do you find the time? Well, I guess you have to create that time, as they, as they will say. You know, it's all about, I think, um, priority. Now, you having a sponsor means, from what I gather, is the sponsor needs to trust you. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, to build trust means you have to have a relationship or some form of relationship, either a work relationship or a social relationship, because, you know, if 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 let's say the people at the top or the potential sponsor is not same color as you you know he doesn't understand your values he doesn't understand your culture you know and um, so that means you know there needs to be some form of communication there needs to be some form of exchange if i may put it that way now will you say the onus is on the employee or on the individual looking for a sponsor to put himself out there, reach out to these people and network with them without having to be judged or stereotyped or seen as pushy or aggressive. How, how, how can, you know, how can someone navigate? Because to me, it almost feels like you know, it's, you're going into territory that is maybe an unfamiliar territory. You know, for someone who is a graduate, who has just graduated from uni, gone into the system, you know, has this ambition to rise within the company. You know, how do you navigate, you know, this issue of diversity within the company, especially when the people at the top, you know, maybe they recognize your work ethics, they recognize your achievements, you know, but are they confident enough do they trust you enough? Do they see you not as a threat, you know, but as an asset to the company to, 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 to sponsor to, for you to rise? It's a really important question, really good question, because actually there is onus on you and on the, on the leaders, right? There's, there's a little bit of education that needs to happen at the top that they need to understand that they need to start mingling right it's not like the gender argument where men who had to open the door for women were actually living in the same house white men who were living in the same house as white women mm. they interacted with women they they kind of got comfortable right At, in a home setting so when you came to work they could trust more easily mm. with the BAME community or black asian community they don't have to interact with us socially they don't have to interact with us at work if they don't want to yeah. So many of them may not have close friends who are like us. So that's where the discomfort might come from, right? That they, they are dealing with people. It's, it's like my story of Amanda and, you know, the kind of initial feeling of discomfort, 
that comes when you're interacting with people from a different culture. Mm. So there is onus on us to educate and, and it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for both parties. Yes. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. So, you know, how do you build that trust? How is, if you know how to communicate with white people, you're comfortable in white company, you will relax, you know how to start the conversation, you will relax into the conversation, you might know the kind of topics they, they're comfortable talking about, right? I, I was just listening to um, a white uh, uh, lady who was very senior leader within the company saying, when she first started in finance, she didn't understand football or, or cricket, but she knew the men, she was, the white men who were working with her were all into sport. So she had to learn the, the lingo so she could have a conversation something like that, right? We need to figure out the lingo, the common stuff we can bring up to ease them into a conversation that, hey, I know your world, mm. right? It's not all about differences. And there is onus on us to kind of break those barriers and, and start having those conversations as difficult as it might be. But we definitely need to educate our senior leaders to start opening the door for these conversations as well. So, 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 in my opinion now, so that means there needs to be some form of education at the top level. Absolutely. Um, but from our own perspective, from our own level, we also have to, um, let me say, adapt. And adaptation means rediscovering oneself. And, and you can do that by either engaging in things that, you know, um, these people find themselves to be interested in. For example, golfing. If, if you know that the senior people in your organization, because you know I'm in the entrepreneur space and, and a lot of deals get made on the golf course. You know? So I, I've already signed up to learn how to play golf because I realized, well, I, I can't beat them. I have to join them and I want to be successful. So what that means, I also have to take steps, active steps, you know, to put myself in a position where I can have meaningful conversation in, uh, less corporate environment because I think that is very key, you know, because that is when you 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 are able to get the best out of these people. Is that it? it, it to some extent, I mean, I don't, uh, you know, I don't know if everybody would feel comfortable taking up golf or, or yeah. anything like that. You know, that yeah. is against the grain. Yeah. What I would say is even small steps matter, right? Sometimes for us, we're we just think they won't be interested in even having a coffee, mm. right? So COVID has been a great leveler to some extent, you know, before the kind of face-to-face -face asking them for a favor might've felt more uncomfortable. Now we're used to emailing everybody. And mm. actually you might be brave enough to email a senior leader you've never met before to say, mm. hey, would you mind having a conversation? I'm really interested in your area. Mm. And just getting comfortable in your own skin in making that first approach, you know, that's what I mean by actually putting yourself out there is, is kind of taking gentle steps. You don't have to, you know, know about skydiving because you think they're a brilliant skydiver, mm. but, but small steps and trying to, to figure out the more conversations you have, you learn, mm. you know, what, what are they interested in? How, how do you learn to pitch yourself the way they want to hear? They might have conversation starters. Yeah, they might, we might all start talking about the weather or the holiday or the whatever. You ease into those gentle conversations where you start feeling comfortable. Mm. And that's what it is. It's kind of getting comfortable in white company because they are the majority, right? In the population, and if we need to proceed, we need to break down their barriers and their bias towards yes. us. Mm. Best way is we educate them in a very gentle way where they don't even feel like it's an education. Yes. Similarly, we have to break down our biases about them and let them in, right? So it's a two-way street, but yeah, making it easier on ourselves the more we interact with yeah. white folks. I, I'll tell you uh, today, because I moved here when I was a child, you know, I grew up around white folk and I go on holiday with them, right? And there are still times when I go on holiday now, there are things they do, I think, what? You know, like after a shower, they might be wandering around in their shower thing. And I'm like, Jesus, I, I go in with four layers of clothes, you know, <laughs> I don't get it. But I kind of know that, that that's something that I don't have to do, yeah. right? 
This is about accepting differences, letting them get on with what makes them comfortable, mm. keeping my judgment to myself. And it doesn't change the fact that we have a strong friendship on 99% of the other things we can talk about, mm. right? Mm. So it's just the more you interact, the more comfortable you feel in their company. Okay, so um, I've got a question here from Oli. Um, it says, as a minority in industry, you go through this exhausting process of feeling you have to prove yourself every time. Um, have you experienced this and how have you dealt with this? It's a very good absolutely, question. Absolutely, Oli, absolutely. I, it is absolutely exhausting. I mean, my one of my pet peeves or areas that I'm trying to focus on is the mental health impact of constant rejections, constantly being battered away, right? And it's a real concern of mine that we are facing, apart from societal injustice and all of that, you know, even at work, we, we face so much more barriers. Now, yes, on the one hand, it's really frustrating and we need to, we can't just accept it. We can't just say, well, oh, well, that's the way it is. We have to try and break down this, right? So that the people coming behind us don't have to have this battle. However, we can't afford to be moping about it and you know, laying down our arms and giving up either. Yeah. You have to pick yourself up and keep going. Knowing, I mean, I tell myself, you know, like I said in my intro, to one point you try and develop yourself. Then after a while you think, hey, you know, is it me or are there other things? And then try and tackle the other things that might be going on. Mm -hmm. So you have mm -hmm. to constantly pick yourself up assess if there's something I need to improve myself you know are they giving me feedback that I need to work on but if there isn't and it's not you then try and figure out what societal stuff you need to work on mm. with a group of people so that you can keep going quite a lot of people have uh, two people actually have already talked about um you know the fact that getting a mentor and, and getting a sponsor rather is, is a difficult one, you know, Emmanuel and Chara have mentioned this, you know, and it, within companies, you know, as, as Emmanuel mentioned, you know, there's a structure, they usually have a structure where, you know, they have a mentorship program, you know, and, and people can, or graduates can go through this mentorship program and, you know, get a feel for, for the workplace. However, how, can, can a mentor be flipped to become a sponsor is another question in my head. You know, how is, is it possible for, and, and, and that depends on if the mentor is senior. In most cases, a mentor will be somebody who is at, at least higher than you, you know, at least a line manager or a supervisor within the organization. Is it possible to flip a mentor to become a sponsor in, 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 in building that relationship? Absolutely. I mean, mentoring is a quite a safe relationship, right? They can be relative strangers, but mm. a mentoring relationship can go on for quite some time, mm -hmm. right? And then towards the end of, you know, once you've established a strong relationship, they're a friend, they're a lifelong friend almost, right? Mm. And I've had personal experience of where a mentor has flipped to a sponsor. So I had another white lady who was uh, my boss, uh, in one of my projects that I was working on. She wasn't my line manager, but she was someone senior mm. in the who could see my day job. And this lady started giving me, you know, development opportunities, development chats. So when I finished, stopped, changed projects, went on to work somewhere else, I went back to her and said, will you be my mentor? So she became my mentor for a while. And then um, at one stage, she was the one who was instrumental in me getting my first director role. She was actually leaving the company and they had changed, downgraded her role to a director role. And she said, I'm not staying here in a junior role. I'm off. And she told me to apply for the job. And I honestly went to her saying, no way, this is, I'm not ready. Mm. I won't be able to do it. Because she had been my mentor, she forced me to apply. Literally, I'm not joking. She literally said, Amberly, you can do this job. Talk to the hiring manager. She forced me. She gave me all of the, I mean, I didn't need to tell her what I could do because I was telling her all the reasons why I couldn't do it. But she told me, as my mentor who knew me inside out, she told me all the reasons why I could do the job. Mm. And it was her job, right, that they had downgraded. So she knew the job. 
So again, chance plays a big part in people's lives, but you have to somehow make the chance. Had I not asked her to be my mentor, I wouldn't have had that relationship. And you can have multiple mentors inside the company, outside the company, in your line, in a different line, you know, and very rarely, if you reach out to somebody that you see who's inspirational and say, hey, would you mind having a 20 minute chat with me? Very rarely people say no. I mean, if, you, if it's a completely like on LinkedIn, you will contact, they, might, they may not respond to you. But if it's someone in your company, most of the time they will drop you a note and either say, you know, in two months time or whatever, right? They will respond. So absolutely be brave enough to reach out and create mentoring relationships because you never know when they might change. Can I, can I come there with a question, Rory? Um, so you just mentioned about getting a mentor and getting into mentoring relationships. Um, but in situations where, for example, you now have that mentor, how do you then go about potentially converting that into a sponsorship relationship um, if the person doesn't sort of, um, doesn't do it almost out of their own initial just instincts and just, how do you, what steps can you take? Or whether it's someone who's already your mentor or someone who's just someone that you've seen and admired in the organization and think can be very helpful to you. Right, so for them to be a sponsor, they have to put their neck on the line, right? They won't do that unless they're 100% confident about you and your capability, which means they should have seen you perform in your job, right? The, the, they, so, so when you first meet somebody or you see a senior leader, you can't go up to them and say, be my sponsor. They won't do it because you know they don't know you from Adam, right? Even when they know you, you need to build up their confidence. It's starting a conversation about building a relationship with them. And, and then if you think that person knows me well enough, they've seen me perform, then, and they're still not offering to be a sponsor, then it's about having an explicit conversation with them. Now, this is highly uncomfortable. I hate doing it myself and I'm not good at it, but I, I just had someone lecture me a few, few weeks back to say, hey, talk to that person and specifically say, I want you to be my sponsor. Will you be my sponsor? Because that's what I need. Yeah. And, you know, and if not now, what will make you comfortable? What, what else can I do? Right. So having a, a, um, an explicit conversation with them, with the, with the view that, you know, what can you lose? At the most, they're going to say no, and you're no worse off. Right. But having an explicit conversation. You mentioned something and it just triggered something in me. You said she had to beg you to take the job. It, it, I'm putting myself in your shoes. I, if I, I think if I saw that opportunity, I would like jump on it. Yeah. But did you have a feeling of, um, I am, you know that your job is good. You work very hard, but was there ever a feeling of, um, I am not fit for this position. And that's why I'm not going to apply for this job. There's always that, uh, for me, certainly, and I am pro probably for a lot of people, there's always that self lack of self-belief, right? An imposter syndrome or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. There's that worry. And most of the jobs I've applied for, they are a step up and they are challenging, right? So I've started almost every role thinking this is the job I'm going to, fail at mm. I'm going to fall flat you know there's a little bit of fear factor always when I'm applying mm. for them because mm. that's also the thing that makes the job really interesting right the fact that you're doing something different so mm. there's always an element of I don't know enough about it and that's there's nothing wrong with applying for jobs that are challenging and interesting mm -hmm. and you might not have done it all and having some of that natural fear factor is fine problem is when we kind of sabotage ourselves by saying I'm not good enough for that job and you know women particularly are, are guilty of this right there's research that if you see a job description and and uh, a man sees he can meet I don't know 50 percent or whatever he will apply right and a woman has to take 80 percent mm -hmm. and a, probably a black woman has to apply for 90 percent mm -hmm. um take and then they'll probably find extra things that weren't even on the job description that they haven't met you know it's just it's just part of it is we sabotage ourselves by saying we're not good enough. And part of it is the society expects us to hit a higher bar. 
So we have these multiple barriers we're having to jump across. So, so to me, what that seems is, you know, to be able to get past this barrier of, of diversity within the workplace, we need to step out there and apply for senior position roles, regardless if, if we think that, you know, um, because there's always this below the line thinking, oh, I'm not good for that job. Or, you know, they, they, they put some caveat and say, you need to have um, business development experience for 10 years. And meanwhile, you almost basically don't have any, you know, but you understand business, you know. So I guess the thing is, we need to put ourselves out there and apply for senior position jobs. And that's the only way we can break through, you know, this whole uh, diversity that has been, you know, sectioned and in, in, in across the industry. You know, the only way to break through is apply. Go for yes. the job, apply. Yeah. You know, but if also, you're not in the running, <laughs> yeah, exactly. absolutely, right. If you're not in the running, you're not gonna get it. And if you think you can do the job, you know, don't apply for random jobs as I don't know, course, me applying for an animated job and I have no creative experience, I'm not yeah. gonna. Mm. But if if you feel that you've got the skills that they're asking, mm. don't underestimate your capabilities. Put yourself in the running and see how you go. And, and tailor sometimes... your CV for the job. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it becomes more apparent when either the person who's your supervisor or your, your, your line manager or something within a company, you know, you work with the person and you're like, does this person even know what he's doing? You know, you, I, I've seen, I've been with a lot of people of BAME origin who have had such issues with their senior management. It feels like, you know, it's a title that they have, but when it comes to execution of that role, they're seriously lagging behind, you know, and you tend to see that across the industry. Anyway, I've got another question to follow that. Um, what, this is from Oli again, what would your advice be to companies trying to improve representation at senior level? So we're obviously actively doing this within our own company. Mm -hmm. So my advice to senior leaders is sort of threefold. One is they need to be good role models, because talking about race and ethnicity is something that makes everybody uncomfortable. Yes. They don't want to talk about it, but they have to talk about this because there's a serious problem. Like we talked about, you know, there's lack of diversity at senior levels. Mm -hmm. They need to acknowledge there's a problem, start role modeling leadership, talking about the change that needs to happen, mm -hmm. open the door for the employees to feel like they can talk about the issues within their company, right? Because until the, the senior leader asks for these conversations and listens firsthand to what's going on in their company, they won't know how to fix it and they need to fix it, right? So opening the door to saying, we really want to do something and role modeling those behaviors first. Second thing, they need to look at their data. Now, data is almost like a swear word. You know, there's a million excuses. Oh, we can't do it because race is so complicated. So many different classifications. And do you look at all of BAME or do you just look at black population or Asian pop? All sorts of questions. And my advice to them is there are many companies doing this already. So look at your peers, figure out who's a market leader. So I always cite EY. EY, Accenture, those companies are doing amazing work, right? Go look at what they have done look at their annual reports, figure out how they have managed to do it. So if I'm challenged in a multinational company, I can't collect data on race because different, different countries have different definitions of race. Yeah. And you know, it's really difficult for a global company to do this. I say, well, HSBC do it, Lloyd's do it. They're multinational companies operating in multiple geographies. They might not do it in the countries where it's illegal. They might only do it in their main company countries mm -hmm where they've got senior leaders, right? The UK, the US, Singapore, whatever. So pick the model that, that you can see your peers doing and figure out your data. Because once you get data, you can then put an action plan that's targeted for you. You figure out whether your problem is attrition, your problem is recruitment at the lower levels or higher levels, You know, figure out whether it's development conversations that are not working, figure out if your hiring is working. But unless you have data KPIs, you can't move on this. The last thing is, 
I tell them to be accountable themselves. Don't delegate it to HR or to IND teams. Leaders, business leaders within their functional groups need to take accountability for making change happen in their lines. This is not something the HR organization can make happen. This is each leader at the top of the organization deciding to take some personal accountability. Yeah. Beautiful um, suggestion. And um, now the, the, the thing is, I, I, I watched um, a, a show a while ago and, and what it said was, you know, the, it's not about the data. The data exists. It's all around us. We see it. Even yes. without the data speaking, we actually see this um, um, disparities. Now, it means there needs to be active actions set within organizations. There needs to be um, consequences as well, which will be set. You know, so actions, responsibilities, accountability, and finally consequences that need to be set you know, within organizations. Because if you're not achieving something, then what happens? It means you're not achieving. It's the same thing, I'm in sales. If I'm not achieving in sales, you know, they call you, they speak to you. If you don't achieve again, they fire you and they bring on another salesperson. It's very simple. So it should Absolutely. be the same approach that should be, you, you know, applied across across the industry and across companies, you know. Absolutely. I, I, it, Absolutely, it, Roy. And, and that is a really, really key point about that accountability piece. And you're right. Data, they don't need data to see there's a problem, right? We, yeah. we weren't, they weren't sharing data with us. We said, we are doing an optical assessment and we can see there's a problem. Our eyes are telling us there's a problem, right? But the reason we focus on data is when they want to fix it, they have to put targets in place. Yes. That's where the numbers come in, come in, right? How will they put aspirational targets? I'm not talking about quotas, I'm talking about targets that they should meet. Aspirational targets cannot be set unless they know what their baseline is. Mm. right mm. so that's why actual tangible numbers help otherwise you don't need it to tell there's a problem because there's like barely any black people above a certain grade right mm. Mm. now um nika has mentioned two things yeah and i'm just going to summarize um it's easy for a female and she says a black female to to get a white male sponsor you know, and, and, and that can be for various reasons. Uh, a, a white male, you know, understands that he has a mother so he can relate. Um, he also understands that he can have a girlfriend, you know, um, and relationships so he can also relate with that. Um, but it's not easy for a black male <laughs> to get a white male sponsor. And, and I would agree with that, you know. So what active steps can, can, can a, a black male take, you know, to get a sponsor within within an organization it's a, again a really really good good question we had uh, at gsk we had a guy called john amici who came to gsk I mean, he's a renowned author psychologist amazing television personality mm. but also a scientist right he was an nba player six foot something almost seven feet tall so he was talking about this perception even though he's a geek a scientist because he's big and black, he's considered like a monster. You know, he's, he, people are threatened by just the way he looks. And I mm. think that's, that's something that, you know, being an Asian woman, I can't understand how that must feel like. I mean, I, I've had colleagues at GSK, male colleagues uh, who are black at GSK say, every time I go into a shop, you know, people are following me around like a criminal. It shocks me that that experience. So that there's a, you know, there's absolutely, I, I know that Black people are the most discriminated against in the world, right? And there, there is this barrier and we, that we need to kind of figure out how do we make these people comfortable having conversations and stopping to starting to treat people like human beings rather than these kind of perceptions or stereotypes or whatever. Yeah. So this goes back to the organization trying to build allyship trying to kind of break down barriers, trying to understand the black experience. So we, within, within our company, we do a lot of allyship training, talk about microaggressions, bias, what's coming in, what the black experience actually looks like, whether it's in the US or the UK, you know, trying to kind of bring to life that racism isn't something that just happens in the US, 
or black people getting murdered by police isn't just a US thing. You know, and bringing in these life experiences, I think it can be powerful. Yes. Now, we are starting to have senior leaders actually actively ask folks to come in and share their experiences. Now, that's a double-edged sword in itself, because sometimes, you know, the same Black people have to be rolled out because they have to talk about their experience to educate mm -hmm. these people, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it can be very emotionally mm -hmm. draining. But that's the only way at the moment to educate these people into understanding how difficult it is. And hopefully, the more people that understand, they'll start breaking down those barriers in their head that they have made up, you know, about Black people, about feeling threatened by Black people and thinking yeah. they're a different species. So it's just, it's an education journey. Even talking about the being threatened, you know, there's... You, you look at it from the point of view of um, you have a lot of highly technical, competent black people, or people of color eh, within the organizations. And you find that some of these white people are actually threatened by just their main skills, you know, the kind of skills mm -hmm. that they have, um, their level of interaction within the company and the, 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 their KPIs that they meet up with, their targets. You know, so they always find some way to either um, be biased towards these people and kind of, you know, suppress their rise, you know. So what happens, um, and, and, and maybe we'll close with this. So what happens in a case where you have this glass ceiling standing right above your head in the form of, you know, maybe an individual, you know, or, or something that stops you from rising up in your company? what would you do? What would be your advice in such a situation? So you can't give up. That's my single biggest advice because this mm -hmm. exists. I mean, this is a, an institutional issue, right? And yes. it exists across many companies. It's not like I can advise you go to another company and this won't be a problem. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, you might be able to jump across to a higher grade in a company immediately, but you will hit that glass barrier because almost everywhere there's this glass barrier. We, we have to keep trying to break it, break it down. And that responsibility lies with every single one of us. Okay. You know, it lies with, there is a tendency that sometimes when you crack through that glass barrier, you then forget about the people coming after you. Mm. And actually those people who make it through that glass barrier have a responsibility to pull others pull up. Others up. Yeah. Um, also, if your glass barrier is made of concrete and not glass, you have to keep trying your best to work around it. You know, if, if it's a manager who's really unhelpful, maybe you can find a, a more senior sponsor somewhere else mm. who can help you find a job in a different line, right? Mm. There are always strategies you can try. Don't give up. This It, it is tough. I'm absolutely not denying it. I haven't found the solution golden solution myself you know I've been hitting against this glass barrier for many years myself mm -hmm. it's frustrating but keep going because you will find a way to get get through it and and know that there are lots of people like you you know I get strength from sharing stories with others who are in the same position because then I know that I'm not a failure you know know yeah. that about yourself it's yeah. not you the system hasn't been set up to help you yeah. So, you know, it's amazing that we make it as far as we do. Mm -hmm. so don't beat yourself up. Stay strong. Keep trying. And on that note, um, Ambili, I would um, like to end this call today. Um, we have had very interesting conversation today. And I would like to say thank you for sharing your, your experience. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your, most importantly, your wisdom. Um, it will go a long way, I believe, in helping people, you know, and that's what we at AFB um, are all about. Um, the leadership program has been set up for this type of situation. You know, how can we break through that glass ceiling that stops people from rising, you know, from being the best that they can in the workplace? You know, how can we get diversity across board from senior executive um, positions down to graduate level. It is no story 
that ethnic minority or companies that are more diverse actually perform up to 33% more better than, than, than other companies. It, it is yeah. not a story. The statistics are there. And it is true, you know. So um, at AFB Leadership, what we're trying to do is, you know, we want to bring about the awareness um, of these issues and how can we address these issues. But most importantly, how can we make ourselves better in leadership? You know, mm -hmm. so if you want to find out more about AFBE, please um, log on to our website um, and join us at afbe.org and AFBE is Scotland, depending on your location. Um, we are very much involved with um, a lot of programs with regards to diversity, inclusion, um, retention, and, 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 and um, next um, um, or, or STEM, STEM programs across schools in, in the UK. Um, so, um, Amberly, thank you very much again. It was a very lovely session that we had with you. And um, we hope to see you very soon when the leadership program is set up. Um, I believe uh, people will see more of your face and um, have more one-to-one -one sessions with you in the future. Thank you very much. To everyone who's made time to join this evening session, I want to say thank you very much. Um, and I'd also like to invite us to look forward to um, the next event, um, which will be in December. Um, it's a Christmas special, um, and we'll be talking about um, uh, the, the five mistakes that people of BAME origin make on their path to leadership. Um, and finally, I would like us to celebrate with AFB UK today, as today happens to be our ninth anniversary in Scotland since AFB has been established. So this is nine years of grinding, um, being led um, by our chairman, Oli, who has been very studious, resilient, <laughs> and, and, and leading the AFB team in, in Scotland. Um, right now, we, we have gained a lot of recognition within the UK space. We have a lot of members, and we would like you to join us and celebrate with us and be part of AFB. And as we always say, be part of something great. So thank you to everyone who has joined. And I will see you on the first Wednesday, which is the 2nd of December, for our Christmas special, Five Mistakes That People of Bay Origin Make. You know, um, it's one that shouldn't be missed. So I will see you all there next month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amberly. Thank you. Thank you. For being a wonderful co-host, as always, um, look forward to seeing you again.